Good afternoon, everyone. Good. <laughs> we're, a bit, we're a bit more intimate here now. We can, <laughs> we can really have some fun together. So thank you for joining us here at this session, uh, Getting Started in Audio. Um, the objective of this panel is to show you where you can get started in audio. Uh, and we've got four experts here that I'm going to introduce you to. And they are from the world of audiobooks, podcasts, audio players, uh, radio. And they're going to share their thoughts and perspectives and provide you with some practical advice if you're thinking of getting into audio. And as most of you will know, it's quite a, a fast-growing uh, part of the industry at the moment. And I'm going to give you some stats right now. I've got some real, real serious stats here <laughs> that should probably, after hearing you, you'll be like, OK, we should get into some audio. <laughs> so um, a recent report valued the global audio market at $5,364.9 million. That's yeah, yeah, yeah I, they put it down a different way here, <laughs> just to confuse me. So Sorry. I was like, whoa. Hold. But actually, did you know that that changed recently? Because, well, in the last, because a UK billion was different to a the, US yeah, billion, and now yeah, we've yeah, all too. gone to the US billion. Hey, but anyway, oh. there's a lot of money. <laughs> 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 all right. And it's expected to expand at a compound annual growth rate of about 26.3% over the next seven years. Uh, the same report notes that kids. Uh, uh, the kids segment of the kids sort of part of that is anticipated to account for the fastest growth, registering a growth of about 28.9% over the next seven years. Uh, in the UK, one in three children and young people listen to audiobooks and or podcasts, uh, with one in six listening to audiobooks and one in four listening to podcasts. Uh, according to a recent survey, 59% of parents are worried about their kids and screen time. You know that conversation is high on the agenda at the moment, so audio, obvious way to, to go. Uh, and audio has become more accessible for children due to the development of smart speakers, which we know are in our houses, and there are uh, over half uh, of the internet households in the UK have smart speakers there. So, as you can see, it's a place that is probably good to explore. And we've got four really great people here to talk about it, and they're going to be able to answer your questions and give you a little bit of insight to that. I'm going to introduce them all, and then we'll find out um, what each and each of those people do. So we've got Jenna Clark, who is from Sleepiest. You can, hand, you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> we've got Carla Herbertson, who's co-founder of Small Warder. We've got Rebecca Oku, who's Head of Licensing at Yoto. <laughs> and we've got Gregory Watson, who's Managing Director for Fun Kids Radio. Yay! <laughs> OK, so let's start with you, Jenna. Tell us a little bit about Sleepiest. So, yeah, so I'm Jenna, and I'm Content Director at Sleepiest. Sleepiest is a wellness company, which is kind of best known for its app which is sleep stories, sleep meditations, and soundscapes that's called Sleepiest. That's been going since about 2018, but we recently launched podcasts in late 2021, so we have a very small network of um, kids and kind of family-friendly sleep and meditation podcasts. Lovely, beautiful. Carla? Um, small Order is a, a, a small children's audio consultancy and production company. Uh, we cover everything there is within the audio space when it's relating to smalls. So uh, audiobooks, audiobook strategy with publishers, and then on the other side we work with um, companies like Yoto producing content for them, as well as um, uh, strategies for podcast productions, podcast productions, and we have are proud owners of our own podcast IPs as well. Yeah. Nice, thank you very much. Rebecca? So yes, Yoto is an audio platform that introduces children to audio across like stories, education, activities. We have our own podcast and our own radio station. We have a, play a, a player, it's an award-winning player that puts children in charge of what they listen to by using NSE technology activated cards so they can sort of take their cards in and out and choose what audio they want to listen to. And so our mission is to really put kids in control of like listening to audio and developing a love for audio as a medium. And last but not least, Gregory. Uh, <coughs> Fun Kids, uh, the UK's national radio station. Obviously, it says what it does on the tin, which is we play lots of great music and have presenters who are like older siblings talking with the children rather than down to them. Um, but we also make a lot of bespoke content, which is things like a weekly uh, story quest drama. 
Um, we also do a lot of learn uh, uh, of audio content, so working with charities, government departments, companies, helping children learn about things, opening their ears and eyes through, through audio. Nice. Uh, uh, so before we get started, I just gave a few stats and things about, um, about audio and how the growth is. In your own experiences from working in it now, are you seeing that growth? Is it speeding up? Is it slowing down? Just tell us a bit about what you've experienced in the last, and to anyone who, who would like to jump in, Carly. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, um, Small Borders only existed for a year, and um, it kind of came about, uh, David, who's a co-founder, he owns Wardour Studios and myself, uh, we just, whilst I was working at a different company, saw through COVID the the rice uh, at the distribution company saw the rice in children's kind of the return on children's audio, uh, and also the rise in platforms, as well as the podcasting. You know, David set up a super great kids stories, a very well known podcast and a very popular, and we saw the increase in that. And so we we have you know, seen from a very close eye ourselves that there's a huge growth and, and the revenues from podcasts are coming in. We're finding that although publishers need to invest in audiobooks, there is a return on investment mm -hmm. there. So there is a real healthy... I mean, it's still in its infancy, you know, compared to the audio, the adult audio market, there is still a lot of, you know, gain to be, you know, had, but it, it is growing. That's and good. just to put a sort of longer time, so Fun Kids, this year, uh, back in May, we celebrated our 18th birthday. Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> which is very scary when you think there. So the child who, who, who was born on the day that we launched is now uh, a fully-fledged adult and can drink. You were born on the day that Fun Kids was launched? No, 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 no adult, you were. Adult. I'm just joking. Were, I'm just were. messing around. Yeah, no, yes, the body hasn't quite gone to play. <laughs> no, but uh, over 18 years, I mean, we, when we started off children's radio was was very very small i mean the bbc did one program on a sunday afternoon there was a lot of people why are you going into children's radio <laughs> Ooh, scary you know and it, it, it was a struggle mm. but i think you know the interesting thing is people have, are seeing that there is a great opportunity to engage with children and i think it's also this thing of you know radio audio mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a, a i've got to think of the right word you know we're not taking away from tv or books or anything else we're supplementing that and i think you know the one thing which i found out by talking to a lot of people is you know to engage children some want visual some want audio someone want books some want some want something that's interactive and actually organizations companies we actually all need to do a variety of how we engage you can't just do audio and you can't just do TV. And ju mm. Just on the 18 years of fun kids, because I was the one working on that one radio program for the BBC, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. And the BBC had the BBC Seven uh, Digital Children's Radio. And the BBC subs uh, have cancelled all of their children's audio since. And fun kids were our kind of competitor then. And so you know, from going, having seven days a week programming or having a couple of programs on, uh, on the BBC, even CBeebies Radio, everything has kind of disappeared, which has been really odd because actually the rise in audio and the rise in kids wanting audio mm. is mm -hmm. just, you know, and, and the biggest broadcaster is not kind of tapping into yeah. that, which is a shame. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, and also, because we work in the sleep space, so we work in sleep and relaxation, and I think for us as well, we've seen a massive growth in children wanting to tune into products like that because their parents are kind of using it as a kind of bridge between YouTube and bed. So they're like, okay, you need to turn off Roblox videos, <laughs> but you can listen to this really fun story if you go to bed. Mm. So we're seeing that kind of used as like the antidote to this like dopamine loop that kids are in and adults as well. Um, and yeah, we've kind of, for us, we launched Coco Sleep in late 2021 not really knowing what was going to happen with a kid's bedtime story podcast. And now it's done 10 million downloads. So I think it grew pretty quick and we're still seeing that growth now because I think, yeah, parents are kind of wanting to get their kids away from screens, but still, you know, kids are smart. They still, they still want some entertainment. They're not going to just go to bed with a book. Well, they will, but not all the time. Um, so yeah, we're seeing growth in that space, definitely. So with so many different sort of formats out there, audio-wise that people can tap into and use. If someone here has an IP and they're thinking of which way to go, where do you think they should start? What's the first thought you need to be having? And that's, that's to anyone. I would say 
make sure that you have the audio rights to license. <laughs> Ooh, let's start with the rights. <laughs> um, I think traditionally audio as a sort of category, as a format, my, my background is in um, children's book publishing. Um, it's been sort of a little bit neglected. I grew up listening to cassettes. Like one of my first audio books that I listened to was Winnie the Pooh. And that's like how I sort of got to sleep at night. And like, I think with the gap between like cassette players and, um, and, and then when things moved on to like digital meant that there wasn't really a way for people to sell or monetize audio before. So it sort of got neglected. And so when you're looking at IP sometimes, where the audio rights sit, who owns it, where they are, it, that can be a bit murky in the, U, in the UK. So I'd say, yeah, find out who owns it. I think, though, <laughs> on, in, I think in terms of platforms, I mean, when we, when we play something on the radio, it's automatically available as a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's automatically available to listen again online. So our, our view is, you know, in terms of once you've got the audio, put it on every platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no point picking that one or that one. Just put it on every platform because, yeah, again... Agree. You know, some children will listen to us through through traditional radios, yeah. but majority of our child audience are probably is now coming and listening to us through smart speakers. Mm -hmm. You know, just make it available across everything. But it's also about what value do you want to add? You know, it's not just having your IP and thinking, right, well, we're just going to slap this on this bit of audio on there. It's really about thinking about. What, who am I serving with the audio? What value can it add to my IP? What do I want to do with it? What community? Audio is such an intimate, amazing space for kids, and you can really build a, a community there where children will engage with far more probably than through the television. And yeah. you probably have the same with Super Great Kids Stories. Is we get hundreds and hundreds of letters, you know, of drawings and to us from kids about the stories, you know. So yeah. it's an, an amazing space What do you think triggers that? Why do you think it's, it's because like Because it's that? such an intimate experience. Yeah. And it's, it's like in a shared, your ears. It's a shared thing with parents and kids mm. and, you know, it becomes part of their routine and it becomes like a special bonding moment yeah, it becomes, for them as well. It, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it does become a... F you know, we don't make... Uh, for our originals, we don't make it for the kids we make it for the kids but we know that we want to catch the parents as well yeah. Yeah. and that's really important because the parents lead the discovery mm -hmm. especially yeah. from the ages probably up until nine mm -hmm. around about nine so they lead the discovery they lead what the kids are listening to so they need to like it yeah. but it needs to appeal to the child because the child will say no don't want to listen to that turn it off so it's about kind of catching those and um, and that's really important but yeah what you know don't just think okay well just going to do audio it's a really special medium that requires yes. a lot of thought mm -hmm. and yeah. you need the rights yeah uh, but you also <laughs> need to really think about actually we can do lots more with this we can build a community we can we can really you know build mm -hmm. something special yeah I, I mean you made me think there it's it's like when you read a book isn't it uh, over watching a film when you read a book you build the pictures in, in your head, head. Yeah. 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 yeah you so build the world and when yourself. you're building yeah. the pictures in your head they feel more personal to you don't mm. they they yeah. you you have more resonance with them so yeah mm -hmm. it makes it becomes total personable sense. Yeah. yeah totally but it's also what jenna said it's that kind of, you know you do that amazingly yeah. with your with the yoto your latest kind of it becomes part of the routine in the family yes. yeah. yeah and yeah. i think you have that with certain programs anyway as children when you grow up you sit around certain programs we still try and do that on certain days but i think that's really important that because audio is so flexible it's an easier part of your day and i think you know it's that repetition yeah. and i, th I think the other it. side of it again is audio is 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 easier you know and what i mean by that is you know we'll we'll might do a call out for children to you know, through the Fun Kids app, they can push a button, they can record 90 seconds of audio. That can be on air within minutes and mm -hmm. things. So you could throw out, right, oh, tell us a joke about a donkey. You know, suddenly you'll get X, Y, Z, yeah. no, X number of jokes <laughs> about donkeys. And, but we can also sort of then build that into other content that mm. we're doing. And I think that's one of the interesting things is audio is easy for children to do. Yeah, they really love it. We have um, a podcast called Yoto Daily and we have like, it's very like a mix of editorial content. So... On Fridays, for example, it's called Friday, and we have children. I think we've got listeners in over 150 countries now, and they send in their jokes. So we might have a child in Wisconsin, and then you know you can record it into your parents' phone. And then we and 
our host, Jake, reads them out. So, and then we have Worldwide Wednesdays, and actually today we, went, we left the world and we went into the solar system, but it's like facts about the solar <laughs> system, and children request things, and, they, and, and if their parent is from a specific country, they'll sort of send a message via, via their parents emailing and ask us to cover that. And they just really love um, hearing themselves and also hearing about things that they have suggested. So. Nice, nice, very good. And um, to hear another side of it, I mean, Jenna, with Sleepiest, you guys started with an app, yes. which is a little bit different to maybe the ways other people start and get mm -hmm. into audio. Uh, one, why did you make that choice? And then secondly, off the back of that, with uh, aiming it at children and it being on an app and a lot of kids not having a phone, how did you navigate that as well? Okay, cool. So um, back in 2018, um, our company, which is Happiest, but Sleepiest is the brand under it, had a good news website. So it was on social media and it was all good news stories. And our mission as a company has always been to kind of bring a smile to people's face. And we were kind of, you know, kicking it on Facebook. The algorithm was doing all it could. And then the algorithm changed. Mm -hmm. And we thought, okay, we're not reaching as many people. You know, we're not making the impact that we once had. And our CEO Hayden was really struggling with his sleep. Like he was literally going to meetings in London and just being like, you know, running a media company was really tough and he really struggled. So we kind of came together with um, Adam, who's our CTO, and Mike, who's our um, designer, our CCO, and was like, you know, what can we do to really like make a difference to people's lives still, still make them happy, but also I think they need a bit of help sleeping. So I'm really struggling sleeping, and I think there's a bit of a market for that. So they'd already <laughs> done a few little games and apps. They had a bit of background in that techie stuff. So they thought, do you know what? Let's just get together. We'll have no C VC backing, but oh well, we'll just kind of put it together <laughs> and make it work. Um, so they thought about like what could we do and Hayden always used to listen to Fantastic Mr Fox to fall asleep when he was a kid and that's what he always used to listen to even when he said even when he was a bit too old to listen to it he still used to put it on at night wait hold on <laughs> are you ever too old to listen no, to no I don't think so um, so he really loved audiobooks so they kind of you know consulted the market health and fitness apps were doing really well as well it was kind of like the big surge in that time so they thought okay I think it needs to be a sleep story and sleep meditation app. I think that's kind of where there's a bit of a gap in the market. So they found the best voices they could, the best writers they could. They started adapting a uh, classic IP. So stories that people knew from their childhood, but made them more sleepiest. So we took out any high stakes, any stress, any <laughs> weird stuff. Because, you know, the Wizard of Oz had some weird stuff in it back then. Um, <laughs> took out all of that and then launched the app in, yeah, 2018. Um, with I think it was like 12 stories, 12 soundscapes. I think meditations actually came later. And it was really well received. You know, people really enjoyed it. And they were all kind of aimed towards adults initially. You know, whenever I say we did adult stories, people are like, oh, sexy stories. I'm like, no. <laughs> it, was just, it wasn't for kids initially. Um, but then slowly we started to get reviews from children saying, you know, people don't read me bedtime stories at night and mm. now I have a bedtime story to listen to or you've really helped me sleep, I'm really mm. anxious at school and oh. you know things like that. So we thought, okay, maybe we need to introduce more kids' stories. Mm. So kids' stories started coming in and they were really popular even with the adults. So we built out a series called The Jupiter Twins, which is actually loosely based on Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually set in Leeds where we're actually based and it's based in the town hall and all this magic. And they just started to do so well. So then we decided when we kind of moved into the podcast space in 2021 like we need to have a kids podcast mm -hmm. so then we found our best voice it was our kids voice and then launched coco sleep wow that's really really cool other side of that you guys move as in the other three of you <laughs> um <laughs> where are you moving in <laughs> Siri trying to tell me so that he's found something on the web. Um, where are you moving to now? What are, what are the new innovations in audio that maybe people aren't using? Because you look at things like the Yoto player, you didn't have like a Yoto player um, five years ago, ten years ago, no. or it wasn't as, as, as prevalent as it is now. So what, what are the new things that you're moving into? You didn't have radio on, your, on the, the player before and, and that's started? No, well, I, the player... Um is really cool because we have a sort of a pixel display. So it's a screen-free um, children's speaker that has no microphones, no ads. So we're sort of carefully connected, but we, we're not a screen-based th thing. It's all about the audio. But the, the, the player is sort of built, was built around Montessori principles. So it's really easy for children to use and to interact with. And what we are, what we are doing more of now is really harnessing the player's functionality to sort of 
bring audio to life, and so we're looking at creating interact interactive audio content. So we've done some quizzes that have been in some preschool, um, some preschool stories. So like, once you finish listening to the story, you can you can basically turn the knob and um, and participate in a quiz about like what what Tom we've done it with um, Thomas and friends actually, and like what did Thomas and James do in the story, and the kids can sort of like turn the knob to find out the answer, and it's it's working really well, and we've had some really good feedback around that. So I think interactivity activities have also worked really well. We've launched an original called Baking with Yoto, so it's like you know an audio recipe that the child the child and their parent follows, and that's worked really well for us. Lovely. Uh, Carla or, or Gregory, where are you guys moving into? What's, what's the next steps for you guys as well? well? I suppose, you know, for us, we're not developing any technology. We, we, we will jump on other people's technology and sort of we're doing quite a bit of work with people like Amazon at the moment. Again, it's that sort of thing of it's, it's in a way for us, we're creating the audio, we're creating that stickiness around it. So again, take, you know, you know, we, we, when we will create activities, downloads, so, you know, you listen to something, go and do an activity, you know, we're just doing a project called Heritage Heroes, which, which is being funded by the National Lottery, which is all about getting kids to think about the heritage around them and record a, their own podcast. So, again, the whole, the, it, we're teaching them how to make a podcast, and then, obviously, through Fun Kids, we can host the podcast and promote the podcast. But, again, it's teaching the kids how to, how to do that themselves. Um, and then, and then that gives us content, but also it means we've got a future generation who are thinking about that as well, mm. as well as learning about heritage. Definitely. Carla, have you got any new things you're working at on well, small? I think it, a lot of it is, the, the, some of it is the strategy stuff, so it's actually teaching other companies how to, you know, deal with audio and how to get the best out of audio and how to produce good audio and how to make sure you've, you know, you've got your revenue coming in, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the same time, it's our own... Uh, our own uh, podcast, so Super Great Kids Stories. We've just launched a new podcast, which is a non-fiction mystery podcast called Bust or Trust, where kids bust or trust myths. And we're looking to kind of extend, do more on our own IP. And then other exciting things is working with clients and really develop their IP. So it's sometimes the clients will come to us and I, I can't really say some of the projects we're working on, but um, it, they're about big big kind of platforms that ki kids are on. You might know one of them or two, you've already mentioned it, but it's about <laughs> kind of making podcasts about that uh, and making make it engaging and how, how, we, sh how we should go about it and, and um, enter that, you know, making sure that it's community and that it's interactive. Um, as Yeah, so very exciting stuff. Um, with all of that in mind, <laughs> there may be some people here who are thinking about getting into audio. What are all of you looking for if you were going to partner or collaborate with someone in this audience? What are you looking for? Jenna, let's start with you. Oh, well, if we were to partner. I think just looking, like Carla said before, like what is the value? Like what is the value that you can bring to the listeners, which is, you know, yeah. which is different? And how, I, I mean, I think at the moment you see so many podcasts and so many audio products coming out now which are kind of carbon copies of other stuff mm. uh, we i hate this word but regurgitated mm. uh, things from other places with a celebrity <laughs> on or a brand <laughs> on <laughs> and i think people think oh you know we've got this huge brand so you know that's going to be enough and we'll just you know we'll do something that's already been done but i think it's just like yeah if you bring value like we are currently going to be partnering with another podcast which is called reach and it's a nasa backed podcast for kids that teaches them about space so we're going to have two of our characters hector and sunny who are actually inspired by our ceo and our voices dog real <laughs> dogs <laughs> hector and sunny they go all kinds of places they've been to mars they've met the easter bunny but this time they're going <laughs> on a full space tour um and we you know we wanted to work with those guys because we wanted to bring that that educational side so that you know, kids can fall asleep dreaming about the stars, but also learn something about the stars at the same time. So I think That's it's just nice. the value in the niche. Yeah. yeah. Right. We're doing a, you know, a lot of things. Is like what you're saying that regurgitating. So we we do good regurgitating <laughs> in the sense of reversioning uh, a lot of, and we've we've done it for you know publishers, which the content then goes on to Yota, for example, is um, kind of taking uh, television. The, di the music and effects track, the dialogue, and looking what we can add to the narration and 
and as well kind of fill it out a bit to, to make sure that it's like an audio product. Mm. So not just kind of taking the dialogue, add a bit of narration, there you go, mm. but really, again, trying to add some value, so um, uh, writing some additional content around it and then produce it so that it becomes a wholesome audio product. Nice. And how are Yoto working with, with collaborators? I think, well, part of my, my job is really I'm looking overseeing UK licensing and I also have responsibility for like our originals program but on the licensing side I think we're sort of building a children's library from 0 to 12 and we really want to sort of um, give children like a, a love of audio that lasts throughout their childhood but also have an audio product for them whatever their interests are so you know we want to build an inclusive and innovative library across all categories really so I think things that are exciting things that fill a gap all the kinds of trends that I think are coming through in wider children's media, I think, can very easily be reflected in audio and of what children and parents want in audio as well. I think, you know, in a way for, for us, we, I, would, I would just say to people, it's, um, it's have a go. And, and the problem, sometimes you've got to stand back. You know, somebody says, right, let's have a go. What are we going to do? And actually, there is no instant answer. Sometimes it is that sort of brainstorming the ideas. We're just doing a, a project with the National Trust, and we're helping them make their first ever children's podcasts. Okay. Um, it's just to, you know, we, we, we're developing the ideas with them. One is the podcast just features animals going, running, scurrying around, having an adventure. The second one is a bit more of a history one, is going back into the Romans and bring. But what we've done is work with some storytellers, with actors, and it's sort of very much we're exploring. We're then going to do the research around that and, and, and develop it from there. But it is that point of, I think, you know, it's, it's none of us have got an instant solution. I think part of it is it's a collaboration. How can we take your brands, your IP, how can we take a new project and actually work with you to bring it up to another yes. level? Um, yeah. And I think that's the exciting thing because it is, you know, you know in terms of audio, one of, you know, are, are the people we work with, they're experts in so many ways. Why do they come to us? Because we know how to make really great audio that engages children. Mm. We don't know your subject sometimes, but we know how to do that, really make that engaging audio. And I think it's, that's the exciting thing, is actually taking something and just making it into different areas. Yeah, and we also know how to make it successful in a sense of, you know, we, we can guide you along the path. I think audio... Is, is quite a separate to television and, and there are certain things, especially within the podcast world, that you, you know, just around strategy, around simple things around design, around metadata, around how mm. the hosting platforms work and all of these kind of things. And it's about guiding the clients and, and helping them with all of that and the creative. Sometimes the creative is already there from the client and we do the, the, the kind of the managerial bit, or sometimes we help with the creative as well. So it's that, yeah. yeah. I think one of the other things, again, which for, for people to think about is, you know, television, films take quite a long time. In terms of audio, you know, again, it can take a long time, but actually, relatively, it's quite quick. So, an idea, so when, I, when I speak to a client and they sort of say, how long is it going to take? Mm. Maybe eight weeks, we can get that up. And they go, brilliant. You know, I think that's one of the that's one of the interesting things that we can we can you know in terms of when somebody's doing a campaign and ultimately maybe there's a film coming out in 12 months time, but using audio as a way of building up the excitement, the entertainment for that yeah. big launch, and we can do that and we can do yeah. that relatively speedily. Yeah, I think it's also when I think about um, yeah audio, it's also a really good way of testing concept as well. You know, like yeah. if you, I think we're seeing now, you know, we're seeing like. The Last of Us was a game that was then turned into a TV series. Like it's not just going that straight kind of book way. So I think what we might see happening now is someone could launch a podcast and then that could then turn into a movie or that could then turn into a series that way because the feedback loop is so quick. You get the data straight away on how many listens, you get the reviews, you know, you get all of that stuff so quickly and the barrier to entry in order to upload and the thing and, just and share to, it is small. And just to add to that, I mean, we, we, we recently did a... Uh, a 10-part drama series um, about the Second World War and about a boy and he's a friend's a badger. <laughs> uh, and he looks after the badger. Um, That's cute. We had a phone call the other day so asking from a, from a film company asking, oh, can they take an option on that? So again, it yeah. is that thing of, there you are. You know, someone's created a great bit of audio. Somebody wants to take it into the film world. 
You mentioned during that little uh, chat you were just having about the quality of the audio. Now, you hear lots of stories of people recording things on their phones at home, uh, you know, just recording. There's so many different ways we can record things now. How important is that quality of audio and <coughs> what should people be striving for? Because there's, there's a lot of debate around this. Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. Oh. We can both take it. I'm like, yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is one that splits, this is, oh. splits the thing, isn't it? Just in terms of radio, where, you know, my background, you know, People have listened to radio stations for many, many years on, say, medium wave and long wave, look at the cricket and look at... So, you know, if, you, if that's the only place that you can get a bit of content, people do not mind about the audio quality because ultimately it's, it's what they want to listen to over the audio, over, over the quality. And again, you know, for years, radio studios had to be built to be, you know, you couldn't hear a pin drop in outside, et cetera, et cetera. I think with COVID, I think we've all sort of changed our views you know we're used to now radio 4 coming from the curtained bunker underneath the staircase <laughs> and, thing. and it doesn't it's it's you know there are certain things where you want good quality audio production but i think ultimately it's the con it's it's what the, it's the content that's king yeah how whether whether it's the per most perfect audio quality in my mind it doesn't matter and certainly for, say for kids i think then they again are, are more interested in the content Certainly, if they're listening, say through a smart speaker or <laughs> device, you know, it's, yeah. you know, they're they, they're not they're not perfect devices. I think uh, working in the sleep space. <laughs> <laughs> no crackling while back, you're sleeping now. I'll go back to sleep. Um, you know, you, it's a very delicate time, yeah. <laughs> and if you have a weird thing going on in the background or some strange noise or even a sound effect that's too loud, that person's waking yeah. up and they're not falling asleep. Yeah. And that's very annoying. <laughs> so imagine you're just about to fall asleep and then you hear a really loud bing, bird bing, or... Bing, bing, yeah, bing. exactly. Or you hear, like, the volume of someone's voice changes when they're trying to meditate with you. I think, yeah, maybe I'm a little bit biased because of the, the arena I agree, I'm working. But I think so. that goes I, back, I, that's I, the audio... That's the quality of the audio content, not necessarily the device that... Sorry, I was going more on the devices that we're talking... That, that people uh, are listening to. Well, but we you're talking, right, we were it's the content... A, the recording... Um, oh, yeah, I saw it more as, like, the actual Sorry. recording. Yeah. But, yeah, a lot of people listen to Sleepiest, the app, and Coco Sleep from their phone. And some people have old phones. <laughs> so, you know, the quality might... be good. Yeah, so... I think, it, as well, uh, you know, the podcast, in podcasting as well, there is a lot of people, you know, doing it in their bedrooms and whatever. But I think the ask of... The more and more you listen as a, um, as a listener to podcasts, the more you want to hear good quality. And I, I really, truly believe that you always have to start with the best quality, really, if you can possibly have it. Because also, if you are, uh, if you do have a go white strategy, you go onto all different platforms, the quality of that phone will be different to mm -hmm. that. So you, you're, you, the quality of the audio needs you to be good to be able to work on, yeah. on many, many different platforms. My answer was actually more going to be about the, the content, actually, and just in terms of like how, if we're thinking about audiobooks rather than podcasts, like audiobooks and kids' activities, and how um, children's audiobooks are quite different from adult ones, and I think they can be really enhanced and brought to life with music, with sound design, with, with SFX, and, um, yeah. and that's, that's a, I think that's about quality. It adds to the imagination. Yeah, I think it really yeah. does. I think yeah. children can really immerse themselves mm -hmm. in it. And it isn't all about the celebrity narrator as well. Oh, God, no. Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> I think we all feel <laughs> slightly strongly about yeah. it. Yeah. But uh, it's the adult advice, it's so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a, ba there's a balance, I think. Yeah. When you, when you talk about um, it's not always about the, the person narrating, I mean, I'm an Audible subscriber, and uh, there are loads of... But, like, say, um, Noughts and Crosses. Mm. I went, I, I checked the sample, I didn't download the book. No. Very because the narration. Because yeah. I want, I, I want to re listen to the story, but, not but to that the voice. sample and yeah. the voice wasn't wasn't feeling it. No. Whereas, oh. like Barack Obama's book was there, and I was like, "Bring it on!" Yeah, but it's Barack. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Exactly. that's a little bit. I mean, it's, really, it's, the, it's the voice, though. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the yeah. way his True. voice yeah. resonates and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Um, moving on to money, because we we spoke <laughs> about how much <laughs> is out there and, and it's being tossed around in this <laughs> in this audio <laughs> genre. Um, how do you tap into that 
with audio? Um, is it about sponsorship? Is it about ads? Where, where, what are the ways of doing it for people that <laughs> might be wanting to get into it? Um, so I'll take this from both sides. So obviously we have the Sleepiest app and then we have the Podcast Network as well, which are both monetized in very different ways. Um, what I will say is that the app has been much easier. People are used to in-app purchases. People are used to paying for audio books on, say, like Audible, buying their credits, things like that. People are used to that subscription model. Um, whereas over on podcasts, I find that people are used to so much free content and used to so much out there that it's, you know, there's so much going on that actually the, the commercials are harder than you'd imagine. We'd come from the app background where we had tens of thousands of paying subscribers every month. It was a really sustainable business. We'd had five million downloads. It was a really good conversion. And then we went to podcasting and we thought, oh, it's going to be the same. <laughs> we thought, and we can run ads. Amazing. We can run ads and we're going to be making absolutely loads of money. Um, but then we soon realized that, you know, especially on podcasts, that the, the fill rate isn't what you'd imagine. Just because you have three ad slots on a podcast doesn't mean they're all full. If anything, on a kid show, they're rarely full. Mm. Um, there's also lots of rules against advertising to children, as we all know. So that then spills over into kind of any audio content that you're providing you know, that you are making. But one thing that we have seen work really well is subscriptions now on podcasts have started to kind of, people are getting used to them. And we find that as, if you're gonna do a subscription-based podcast, which, you know, Apple Podcasts are a great one and there's lots of other providers, just make sure your benefits are there because people are like, ad-free, that's not enough for me. I'm used to the ads, I'll skip the ads, I'm not bothered. Mm. But, you know, if you can add value such as live events, you know, merchandise, if you can make them feel part of a club, we do a thing on Coco Sleep where you can only get a shout out if you're a Coco Club member, <laughs> which you can imagine how many children are going, Mom, <laughs> I want to hear my voice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, um, I think just you can, you can make it work and it can be great, but I think you have to be in it for the long haul. It's not going to be an overnight kind of cash in the bank. Like you've got to work at it. Your download numbers, just if you're doing, say, you know, we do... 1.1 million downloads a month on Coco Sleep, which you'd think, wow, you must be, you know, if that was on YouTube, it'd be fantastic. But then our, some of our adult shows, we've got some meditation and uh, bedtime stories for adults. Um, they do a quarter of the downloads, but make more money in advertising. So I think it's just finding that balance and being in it for the long haul. That would mm. be my advice. Yeah, so there's two, th is there audio products? Is it audio book? You have a two to three year return on investment, mm -hmm. so you produce it, and then it takes about two to three years t for you to make your money back, but you need to make sure that you are on amazing platforms like Yoto. Mm -hmm. There's other, can I mention the other ones? Yeah. <laughs> There's other ones out there too. I love her. I know the one you mean. We all know the one you mean. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and make sure you have a very much a go white strategy, so that's in relation to audiobooks, and then when it comes to podcasts, as Jenna said, it's about kind of subscription, sponsorship, ads don't necessarily work. Um, and yeah, so that's why it's really, really important that when you go kind of the podcast route, you, you choose your, you know, if you are a publisher, you probably go more the audiobook route, or maybe you want to make some audiobooks. Really think about the difference in products. The podcast, far more engaging and far more community building. So then you need to think, okay, this, this podcast, in order to make money, would need to, you know, you need to have a weekly kind of, um, podcast that's there, kids are waiting for yeah. it. So, you know, the podcast you want to make, is that sustainable for a year? Uh, you know, is your episode number five just as exciting as episode number 105? Yeah. And can you keep doing the same thing? And can you sustain it? Um, have you got the resources? It, it, it's a lot, but once it's there, you know, we have events, we have merchandise, we, you know, we have a a group of fans that we can just tap into. And, you know, um, like Gregory was saying earlier, for us, it's, it was like, you know, publishers coming to asking for um, having the rights to our podcast for, for a book. So it's, you know, so we, we are looking, there are different revenue options there as well, but it is, yeah, you need to be committed. Yes. <laughs> Becca and Gregory, anything to add to that? I would just say on the audio book side, if, like we work with IP owners and, um, and publishers and content owners, um, and we are another audio platform for them. You know, there are other, there are lots of other ones. So that is the way that those IP owners monetize their audio content by distributing it to audio yeah, platforms. Yeah. I mean, most of most of the uh, the, the revenue generating models have been mentioned. I think the one which hasn't 
and the game which, which we do sometimes, is a commission. You know, so we will get, you know, we work with some engineering organisations, they want a, a monthly podcast for children. It's distributed through their platforms, but we're commissioned by them to make, mm. yeah. and, you know, mm -hmm. 12 podcasts every year. So I think that's an interesting one of, you know, in a way that, so it's not our content, mm. it's, it's our clients' content, but we're just working with them and, but then through the radio we can help promote it, which is obviously one of the other issues about podcasts, is always making people aware of them. So if you can combine radio, podcasts, commissions, uh, hopefully it's a sunny day. <laughs> Uh, one more question before we sort of open to the floor to uh, hear what people's questions are. Um, is it possible to have straight crossover content that is visual and audio, as in, let's say, can you make a program that is as it is, visually, on screen, mm -hmm. but is also just absolutely perfect for audio, or do you think there needs to be tweaking and before it's be, uh, an audio thing. I'm, basically, I'm what I'm trying to say is... You've got you an just idea. you got an idea, Miss? <laughs> <laughs> I've always got an idea. Always well, got an idea. Just to start off, I mean, so years ago, we worked with Hit Entertainment. We took Thomas the Tank Engine. The, we took the cartoons. We, uh, we converted that and made it into a series of audio programmes for broadcast and podcast. Did and much happen in between? Or was it straight, take the episode, what, boss, put it? There was, that one, I'd say, was 95% Right, OK. That's, that's but then go the other way around. So we now have an animation team. So some of the audio that we create, we then straight animate it. And that's 100% same audio, oh, wow. straight to animation. I think it's easier that way around than oh, the other way around. easier to go from, from audio, audio to, to... Well, when you think yeah, about it, I always vision, say to people, yeah. you know, you can't really do... You know, I might get stones flung at me from animators in the room. But my <laughs> one is, in a way, that, you know, you can't animate until you've got the, the soundtrack. Yeah. So, yeah, actually, yeah. audio is a great way of just doing that next stepping yeah. stone to animation. Cool. Yeah. Very good, yeah. very good. So, it's that time. We've got about 15, uh, tw 20 minutes left. We'd love to hear from you guys, your questions about trying to get into audio and, and things you might be thinking. So, please, if you have a question, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get one of the mics over to you, this lady here in the blue shirt. Couple, right, forward a bit more, there you go. I don't think you're on yet. Just talk and I think they'll fade it up. Great. Um, uh, basically, um, my writing partner, Jen, and I do um, musical theatre writing composition. And we're just kind of interested in things like audio and, and how, do you, how do you work with musicians and composers? And um, what's, what's your relationship with them? How do those relationships start? Because I'm sure there's music in there. <laughs> I like you, you <laughs> um, so yeah, we have um, one sound engineer that we work with who is a musician. He's um, he's fantastic. He actually lives in Greece and he's called Socrates, which is the most Greek name. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> and he is an angel. We always say he's so creative. And with uh, with that, we really you know take his lead. So he will review, say the story. So say it's a Coco Sleep bedtime story. He will kind of listen to that whole track and he will kind of pitch his idea and he'll say, okay, needs to be super sleepy. I know it's sleepiest, but how about we do some of this? And how about they go to the rainforest? Let's have some rainforest sounds. And we just really take his lead on it and we don't try and pigeonhole him and say, well, our idea is this because we can always work on it afterwards, but he's the expert. So, and you know, when we've on Sleepiest, we have soundscapes and we've worked with loads of different composers on that. And th we never like to, again, like say, we want a soundscape that sounds like this because we're not the experts in music. We might be the experts in narration and audio, but in terms of music, like it has to really come from that creative person. And he'll, so he pitched us, and the only, actually the only time I've ever pitched a soundscape idea was, it was quite niche. It was when you're a kid and you're upstairs in your bedroom, but your parents are still having dinner. And it's like the sound of them downstairs, <laughs> which I thought was quite niche. But he said, no, I, I get that. It's like, you know, when you send to bed early when they're having a bit mm. of a party and there's some <laughs> nice music going on and it's quite cozy. Like cuddle, yeah. the hubbub. <laughs> yeah, the hubbub, the hubbub exactly. The hubbub. And he really worked with that. But other than that, he will just come up with an idea and uh, we let him have free reign. So. Yeah. But there must be other yeah. ways as well. So, uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I think it's similar. You know, again, when we, we've had we've we've had a sort of a, a drama series, and we said, like, right, what do we do in terms of music? So we just went to someone we knew. They they did the whole music bed, which was just great. <laughs> yeah. Question off the back of that for me, uh, just you've inspired uh, orchestras. Mm -hmm. On have you worked with any orchestras on audio stuff? 
my ideas are flowing mm, again. I know. Orchestra. I've just come wow. off the I've just come off the CBB's prom. That's why we uh, just did it at the, at the Sheffield City Hall. Yeah. And you're telling a story for kids. Yeah. Mm. And we went on an underwater adventure, and we've got the orchestra playing, and wow, it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful yeah. music. And <laughs> I'm just wondering if, if if that's ever been done or thought of. It has been done. I, I remember for a, a client we're talking to now, but they've done it for their animation, the London um, uh, Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, Symphony Orchestra for their Mars and space uh, kind of animation. And yeah. he was looking. He's contacted me to say, "Look, we really. It's so amazing. We really want to do something with this. Um, you know, in the audio space as well. So yeah. from that kind of perspective. But, but yeah, for us, we have. Um, David, my co-founder, is a music composer himself, and um, our uh, sound designer or our sound engineer is a, a musician. So we create a lot of the music, but we also outsource. And a lot of publishing houses we work with, they have their own kind of music composers and design uh, sound designers. They they work. They want to pull onto some some projects, and we work in um, cooperation partnership with them. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Uh, let's come over to this lady, and then we'll come across to you. Hi, my name is Gatti. I'm from Akama, and I'm an audio-led content senior producer. Um, but taking from the orchestra to the new kind of medium, AI, are you petrified or excited? Oh are you we haven't talked about AI yet. Oh, yeah. We haven't talked yeah. about AI. Oh, we've we've, still, we we've still got time, folks. We've still got time. Hold on, we'll get on to AI. We've got 15 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no, you go first, there's so much to say. There's, there is so much to say. I mean, because um, we work with so many voices, so across Sleepy Sight we have 11 voices and then we have um, four different podcast hosts as well. Um, it has been something that's come up in conversation. Some hosts are really excited about it because they say, well, if I make a mistake in this audio, we give it to the AI, it'll fix it, I don't need to go back into the studio. Or there's also this really interesting concept where you can... Uh, basically capture someone's voice at their age so then even when they become 70 or 80 years old mm. their voice changes they still sound the same which is no more 10 pe peppers yeah. seven pepper pig because they're uh, all different yeah. peppers yeah, yeah. yeah. stick to one exactly yeah. so there's a, there are some exciting things but then we also have some of our voices who go you know, what if you replace me? You own all my audio. What As if a you presenter, that's the question we're yeah. asking. Yeah. We're sitting there going, hold on, yeah. I've just recorded a whole TV series. Are you going to make the next four or five of them exactly. with, with my voice? But like, yeah. yeah, we've had to basically, you know, write into contracts with our voices mm -hmm. because our partnerships are our most important thing to us. You know, the relationship we have with everyone we work with. Um, that we're not going to do that. <laughs> we yeah. said, you know, you're going to have to trust us. And if that changes or if the landscape, we, you know, we're at the tip of the iceberg for where things are going to go, we'd obviously bring them in as partners on that. You know, it wouldn't be like, we own your voice, see you later, because we just don't want to operate that way. Um, but we are also very aware that our production is very expensive. And if people get into AI in a big way and can produce something of our level, using an AI tool at a fraction of the price, it, it could cause issues for us. Um, and I think it will result in, you know, I think in a way there'll be some people who are happy to sell their voice. I've, I've worked with a voice actor recently who has sold his voice to Amazon. He's not bothered. Too early, mate. Too I early. know. <laughs> <laughs> you went know. too early on the sale I of know. his own voice I did there. say that. I thought, really? I said, how do, what, how's that work for us? He said, oh, no, they've said I can use it elsewhere, but they're allowed to use it however they want. Um, so I think people are... Choosing Soul. their side. People that choose their side usually for certain amounts of money. Um, but yeah. we've had to. Actually, yeah, I didn't see the deal. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if it was 50 minutes, it was like, take my voice, deal. there you go. You know, because I, I listened to a podcast the other day and it was. Um, it was Tom Hanks on there and he, they were asking him, you know, how do you feel about the fact that the studio owns your likeness and owns your voice? And he said, well, after I've died, they can make movies with me and my children will get the money. I'm not yeah. bothered. Yeah. Uh, so I think everyone will have their own kind of deal to be had with it. But personally for us, we don't think you can get the same warmth from an AI voice. It will yeah. get there. <laughs> yeah, it will And there get are already there. ways. I heard one the other day, which is actually not text to speech, it's voice to speech. So somebody could basically, they could get another voice actor in to speak and it would transform into your voice actor's voice with the same inflections and mm. warmth. And also, you know, but then I know it's scary, but then <laughs> we also, with Coco Sleep, Abby is our 
brand, you know, her voice is, I mean, if nobody's, if anyone's not listened to it yet, please do, you'll fall asleep so quick. <laughs> She's the most relaxing woman That's ever. A good salesperson. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's my background. Um, but, you know, we discussed with her, well, how about if we could have Coco sleep in 11 different languages, but it's yeah. your voice? Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's things around that with culture. Will people like her voice if it's in another language? But, you know, there are sides of it where she could be brought on as a partner because she can't speak 11 languages. Mm. So wha- wha- rather than having another voice do it, it would still technically be her. She'd have her royalty. She'd still be part of the deal. So it's S- different sides. I was going to say a slightly really different thing on, a, on, on AI, though. So <laughs> we did a podcast about AI yeah. for our, one of our engineering partners the other day. So um, we actually did use, you know, Siri and Google and things to actually just give us the answer and we just recorded it and then managed to sort of put that into the podcast so I suppose we did get rid of somebody but we just got them to actually make a podcast (laughs) that was quite interesting (laughs) it's an interesting space the AI space and I think it's 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 a a whole panel in its own like and then for different like different disciplines you know (laughs) audio animation I mean yeah Yeah, it's, it's it it's one that we're all going to be keeping a close eye on, and don't sell out too early, folks. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman here oh, in the... Oh, oh, no. I think this man's been waiting. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Oh. Sorry, I got the mic, so I kind of jumped oh, the keys. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm John, uh, I guess, independent producer. So it's more of a question for Rebecca and Gregory. Um, two things. One, you said put it absolutely everywhere. Um, so I wanted to understand how that impacts on the, sort of the financial model and your attitude to deals. And what, in a bit more detail... Does a lic- do you license an IP to do as audio books if the audio books exist? And are you essentially paying a price and that's it? Because a standard licensing deal is somebody pays in advance, there's a royalty share, etc. How do your kind of license deal to establish content compare to a traditional license deal for an IP going into, say, a T-shirt or something where it's advance royalty back, etc.? You've got a different model, I suspect, so I'd be incl- interested to know a little bit more about that. Um, well, without, I mean, we work with lots of different partners and without going into sp- specifics, we, we work on a, a licensing sub rights model where there is a royalty involved for existing audiobooks so that we publish things on our platform that exist on lots of other different platforms, things that you will all know, like, you know, your best loved children's book or Fantastic Mr. Fox or something like that, that exists, it, it has been created by the publisher and exists in other places so i would say that audio wise it audio wise yeah, yeah. audio wise it, it, it exists as, a, as an audio book and then it, you can buy it on various different platforms i would say for for us for yoto that doesn't really impact impact on our our model if you if you see what i mean because we are a an audio platform we have a player and for us we are our, commu- our community and our users, they, bu- they usually will buy into the player and buy into our ecosystem, and we are providing them with a choice of, a choice of children's content, like best-in-class children's audio content. Just to give a little bit of help with the explanation for that, for those of you who don't know, a Yoto player, you, can, you have a card? Yeah. That, so um, say you're listening to Fantastic Mr. Fox, you can only listen to that Fantastic Mr. Fox if you have this card yeah. to do there. So you won't be listening to the Fantastic Mr. Fox that somebody else is listening to on Audible. So Oh, no, you would be. You, you, you would that be. would be the same. Yeah, oh. it is the same. But does yeah. that create the royalty stream? The re- i.e. the fact yes. is that yeah. if you've sold 1,000 units of Fantastic Mr. Fox on yes. your system, then the royalty is coming from the 1,000 units if you've done yeah. a royalty deal. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Is that what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So if you've sold no units and no, you, no you money. paid no yeah. advance, yeah. then there's no money. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So if you're the IP owner, you're having different revenue, revenue streams coming in from various yeah. different places, yeah. which is what Carla was saying about you know, investing in that audio content at the outset, you will sort of see that return coming, coming Whether back. it's from Yoto or... <laughs> yeah, they're, different. they're all different business models in relation to if you were looking at audio books per unit payments, pool, pool rev share models, other subscription models... And it's about the deals that you do with those platforms or through an aggregator and making sure that, um, and and those kind of licensing agreements, and you get a certain percentage. So if you go through an aggregator, most of the time it's an 80-20 split or a 75-25 split uh, in favour of the uh, publisher. Um, And then you, aside from that, because you've got children's content, you need to make, because the aggregators don't, 
kind of um, distribute to the children's platforms, you need to have direct relationship with all of the children's platforms in order to make sure that you, because that is where your audience is, to make sure that you um, kind of get on the, onto those platforms. And there are loads of different type of platforms. You know, you've got the players, there are also some digital platforms, but they really rely on the direct uh, partnership, partnership sort of thing. And, and all of them are non-exclusive. You can yeah. do direct deal with, uh, a, an exclusive deal with Audible, but that will leave you out of pocket because you won't reach as many kids, and so you have to do the non-exclusive deals. Gregory, what's your model? Sorry, in terms of do you license content to turn into stuff for Fun Radio? So no, I mean it's sort of most of the content we produce. I'd say um, we would have a sort of it's it's the, it's new content in a way. So we're not necessarily take going to a book publisher and then converting their book into an audio book. We might be going say to you know we did some we're doing some work with National Grid, so we are developing some content based around their Grid for Good uh, activity. But in a way, so there's no, there's no real IP. There's a certain amount of, there's a little bit of IP, but it's not really, what we're creating is new IP that we share with them under our contracts. Um, and when I sort of said about platforms, I mean, our, you know, my one is we want to get the content out to as many children as possible. So we have to be thinking about, you know, just those different ways which children will listen. You know, they're, you know, in their bedroom, they won't have a radio. They'll have a smart speaker. There's probably a radio in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certainly a, probably the radio in the car, although that's now changing with, you know, the cars now going to be through the smartphones and things. And that's why we just got to think about those platforms in terms of just making sure that we're, 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 we're on the platforms which the families are going to be using. Thank you very much. This gentleman here was waiting in the way. Thank you. Hi, it's Miles from Wildseed. Um, you had the panel have quite a visceral reaction to the idea of celebrity, uh, vo <laughs> celebrity voices, and I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. It's, uh, this feels counterintuitive in some ways, but um, I'd like to uh, understand a bit more about your experience with that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't say my reaction was visceral. We publish lots of things that do have celebrity narrators, and yeah. they do very well. Okay. I would say I would just. Just sorry, just it's not the be all and end all. No, I would just say yeah. be all and end for yeah. smaller yeah. for smaller producers, for smaller IP owners who are sort of wondering how to create an audiobook or an audio product who may not have that budget, I think things like sound design and music are just as important for children's as audio. As a good voice. Yeah. Got it. So it, well, you know, I mean, you want a good voice, but a famous voice is, you don't need a famous <coughs> voice. You don't need, yeah, yeah, you need a good voice, not a famous yeah. voice. And yeah. I, th I think, you know, obviously a lot of the, the bigger publishers go for those bigger famous voices because the again the the buying is is triggered by the adults who want to you see it on cbb's bedtime stories yeah they yeah. are read by you know it's the the parents that are like oh we want to watch that and then make the kids the watch it you know, know and they, and the, but the child doesn't know who it is and it's <laughs> they don't irrelevant. know who tommy's girls they don't know who <laughs> <laughs> they're just like mommy why am i watching this yeah. I'm, I'm going to bed yeah. <laughs> it's, the it, it, it's the same principle it's the same principle yeah bedtime stories have been going so since so everywhere I was at CB how many years now for, for many 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 years for, on that principle and it's to draw the parents in and I think that's the same that yes. kind of publishers are doing you but you, good voices you don't need no. you don't need it no um, I think it's making yeah. it, it making it real so again there's something I picked up that was in the the, the fandom session earlier mm. And there was the comment there about making it real. And, you know, we've just done, um, we just did a, a drama based around Windrush. So, you know, one of the things we made sure is that we had the right people reviewing the scripts, the right people recording mm -hmm. the script, to make sure that we had the right sound, the right tone of voice, everything. So, you know, and I think that's important. So, in a way, it's the right people rather than maybe Mr. Or Mrs. Big. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think for us, because um, Sleepiest, the app, is kind of one of our main competitors, is Calm. Yes. Um, and people are always saying, why don't you have this celebrity I like reading me a bedtime story? And we're like, because that, you know, that might work for you. And it might work as a really great, obviously, marketing tool. Yeah. Like, whoa, we've got this guy uh, doing a story. But then once that person has listened to that story a few times and realised that maybe it's not very good because it's not a professional voice actor, potentially, yeah. or it's someone who's kind of, you know, just doing it 
for the sake of it rather than being super involved and passionate about the project I think you can get far you know far more of like a long-term listener from having a voice that they really trust they can connect with and also I think people buy from people so I think if you want you know to do a successful kind of audio product you want especially with a podcast you want someone to feel like they are giving back to that host for the value that they're bringing and I think sometimes with celebrity it can be like I don't need to give you know I don't know Tom Hardy any more money <laughs> <laughs> Jenna just cued me up nicely to say if the kids know them already and they have a good voice maybe <laughs> someone like Nigel Clark might be <laughs> <laughs> We can always very, have a guest. <laughs> very, very well done. <laughs> so, who's the next question from? Oh, wait, are we done? We've got. Oh, we're done. Oh, we're we done. Wait, oh. Have we, what's the time? Oh, done. Oh, yeah, oh, we, bang are. On. Bang we are. We are. Bang on. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I would have loved to have some more questions, but mm -hmm. it is six o'clock and we have to clear this room. Thank you so much to everyone here on this panel. Thanks to Jenna. Thanks to Carla. Thanks to Rebecca. Thanks to Gregory. Thank <laughs> you.